Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, Senior Director of Programs at Jewish Funders Network, and I'm happy to welcome you to today's program, the IDF's Biggest Challenge. As Israel celebrates its 74th birthday, we take pride in the remarkable success story of the IDF, which secures Israel's independence and continues to guarantee its survival today. But the military is changing rapidly. In today's startup nation, cyber warriors are fast replacing foot soldiers on the front lines of the modern battlefield. The field. At the same time, Israeli society is changing in ways that threaten the IDF's future, uh, future's ability to protect the country. Today, less than half of Israelis 18 year old currently serve in the People's Army. And if, that cur and if the current model of service is clearly unsustainable, what can replace it? So those are a lot of big questions um, for us to tackle today. So we're very um, fortunate to be joined by experts from the Israel Democracy Institute, IDI, Professor Amichai Kohn, Yochanan Plesner, and Dr. Edi Chafrin Gittelman for, for fascinating discussions on the challenging relationships between the army and society in Israel and the implications for Israel society and its democracy. After we hear the presentations, we're gonna have a chance to, for questions and answers. So please write them in the chat and the Q&A box in the bottom of your screen. And now I'm happy to introduce Yochanan Plesner, president of the IDI to get us started today. Thank you, Yochanan. So thank you, Tamar, for the kind uh, introduction. And uh, you said it's the, uh, we're gonna talk about the IDF's uh, biggest uh, challenge. And, and you also, uh, said IDI's biggest challenge. So it, was, it wasn't actually a mistake. Oops. <laughs> because, <laughs> because, you know, both we are dealing, it's a huge challenge and this is why uh, uh, we, we took it uh, on ourselves. And, uh, and, and we'll try to uh, sort of shed some light on this uh, uh, issue uh, by managing this uh, three-way conversation. So just before we dive into this, uh, to the subject, uh, we cannot uh, disregard uh, the, uh, the events and try to connect them to, to the subject of our discussion. So Israel is, for the past month and a half, 19 Israelis were murdered in terror attacks. And uh, just today, just a, a, an hour or, or two ago, another attempt for a terror attack in the old city in Jerusalem, the terrorist was uh, 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 killed and, didn't, and, and, and there are no casualties uh, on the, on the civilian or, or military side. Um, uh, but we are dealing with a wave of terror that is very much affecting all, the sense of security of Israelis, uh, uh, the perception of security, and also very much shaping the attitude of Israelis to the Israeli uh, government. We know that about uh, 33% in a recent uh, IDI uh, uh, figures that we released, 33% of Israelis uh, provide a positive rating for the, to the government for how it handles the security situation. 42% poor and 21% uh, mediocre. So we, we, uh, there is much criticism. It makes it also difficult for the government, um, um, uh, uh, politically difficult, not only because of dissatisfaction among the general public, uh, but also this huge experiment of an Arab party in the coalition and, and this party is feeling pressure from its own base uh, uh, because of the tensions and events in Temple Mount and the alleged events that uh, 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 presumably are, are taking place and sometimes false uh, uh, propaganda about uh, what's taking place in the Temple Mount, but it makes it politically even more challenging. And, uh, and, 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 and it's connected to our subject matter in two ways. Number one, uh, it clearly uh, having a strong military is, is not uh, 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 a nice to have, but uh, a necessary element of our survival. And the, the discussion we're going to have is about what, what is required and, and what are the trends in terms of a model of service to ensure that the IDF will continue to be able to deal with Israel's serious uh, uh, security challenges. And number two, uh, the security situation affects the political situation and the political situation is very unstable. We didn't know this morning whether we're going, whether the, this afternoon a vote of uh, uh, 
uh, to uh, disintegrate the Knesset will uh, dissolve the Knesset will uh, uh, pass in a pre preliminary reading. So far, it, it, it didn't pass. It wasn't uh, uh, voted on the assembly, but it's uh, but the precarious situation of the coalition makes it also more difficult to make the necessary legisla legislation uh, to stabilize, change, and modify the, the model of service. So again, security, politics, model of service, all are all connected. And uh, obviously we will also, whatever we won't address right now, we can address uh, in the discussion later on. I'll also look forward to hearing what Amichai has to say on uh, the uh, how, how will the IDF uh, uh, dive into and look into the uh, the event that took place today of a reporter, uh, an Al Jazeera reporter that uh, 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 that uh, was uh, killed during the clashes, and uh, there are conflicting claims about how that took place. So thanks again. I hope we were going to have an interesting discussion. And indeed, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Yochanan. So uh, you were talking about the Israeli uh, security challenges uh, that no one denies, as, uh, as you mentioned, and also no one denies the challenges of the relationships between what we call the military and society, uh, which brings us to the main topic of our discussion today, which is the current uh, model of service and its sustainability. So what I think is that while we all love to love, or at least uh, think that we love to love the People's Army model, and Ben Gurion's narrative and thoughts that come with it, uh, reality shows that in fact, what uh, the model of service that sustained Israel for 74 years is no longer uh, is no longer sustainable and is, and is now almost collapsing. As said, uh, with fewer than 50% of draft age men, uh, including Arabs and ultra Orthodox men, of course, but they are also part of the society, are now in fact serving the people army in the people army. But uh, what is even more interesting and maybe more important, as I see it, is that the majority now is supporting changing the model of service and maybe abandoning the traditional one and even adopting a new one, maybe even uh, not a mandatory service, but rather something towards uh, what the society says as a professional, uh, as a professional army. Although we know that there are some models within between the, uh, the order of the the People's Army and their service uh, and their professional service. So with these numbers in mind, I want to ask you, Amichai, uh, the main role of the IDF is, of course, to defend Israel. Uh, no one uh, denies it. Uh, we all uh, agree with it. But it also serve, uh, serves an important purpose, or at least it used to serve, and I would like to hear your note on that, as what we call uh, a melting pot uh, for the Israeli society. So maybe for start, take us on a quick historical tour towards uh, Ben Gurion's um, vision of the people army, what exactly or what more or less did he have in mind <laughs> talking about this uh, model of the people's army and are all the aspects and maybe even principles uh, derived from this model still relevant to us these days? Okay, so thank you very much uh, for having uh, uh, us, Tamar, and thank you, Yohanan and Edith for your uh, introductions. And um, indeed, the uh, there are enormous differences between the security situation of Israel when Ben Gurion initiated the, I, the model of service of IDF and designed it and today's um, uh, model. And I'll just point out a couple of, of principles in, in, in this area. First of all, the security needs in Israel. And as, as you all mentioned before, the main goal uh, the main purpose of the IDF is to protect Israel from its enemies. Um, and uh, mandatory military service or the idea of the people's army, maybe we'll uh, analyze this term later uh, a bit. What do we mean when we say uh, the people's army? But at least one meaning is that the army is built on all the people. So the entire population uh, cohort when it comes to the age of 18 um, is drafted uh, to uh, military service. This, this idea was first and foremost a security necessity. So you need a lot of manpower. And when I say manpower, I mean, and maybe we'll get into it later, men were sent into uh, battle 
in 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 these area uh, in these early days, and you need therefore you need to uh, enlist everyone. A mandatory service is required. There were other um, needs. Uh, it was also, as you said, a melting pot of the Israeli society in 1940s, 1950s. The, the Israeli society is a society of immigrants coming from all four corners of the world to Israel. Ben-Gurion thought of it as a way to uh, build a nation through the service and the army. And the third point, which is very important, a young state, no resources, the army served, and maybe this is the uh, second meaning of the people's army, as a nation builder in practical needs. So the army built uh, the camps where immigrants stayed, where, where they just came, and the army was involved in education and in uh, building settlements all around the country in these early days. Now, what is left from, from these needs? And this was the second uh, point of your question. Now, in fact, for some, some of the needs are not there anymore, or at least we already gave them up. So I'll start with the last point. So Israel is now, uh, we just celebrated our 74th uh, Independence Day. Uh, in terms of resources, Israel is rated one of the uh, richest countries in, in, the, uh, in the world, certainly one of the Western uh, countries. There is no need for the army to uh, deal with assistance to society. Second, in terms of nation building, now, there is an Israeli society. In fact, and we will get to that later, if it, anything, the army is not so much a nation builder, maybe it's even a nation divider because people, a lot of communities are not serving in the military. So there is this gap between those 50% who serve and those 50% who do not serve and the security needs. Now, there is no question. Um, the uh, Israel is still threatened by enemies and still needs a very strong army. But what does a very strong army mean in today's world? So how many people are needed? And in fact, all the uh, uh, knowledge that we have is that in terms of manpower in the next generation, uh, there will be too many people. The army will not know what to do with the entire cohort that it, even if, no, 50%, at least these 50% are a lot more than what the army uh, requires for its ongoing operation. Now, it's clear, and maybe we'll speak about it later, that Israel is not ready and it's not a sustainable model for Israel to move to an all volunteer force. We are not, we are not there. I'm not saying yet or not yet, we are not there. Israel still requires a large number of people who serve. Reserve is very important for Israel because of the threats. So we are not there yet, but something has to change in the current model. And maybe we have not said anything about the current model of service. So what do we speak about when we speak about the current model of service? I'll just, you know, you, um, um, uh, Yohanan and, and, and Edith and Tamar, you have all spoken about some statistics, but I just want to lay out what the current situation is. So the current situation is that uh, every Israeli who reaches the age of 18 is supposed to serve for 32 months, if he's a man, for 24 months, uh, women. Uh, the exemption, when we speak about 50% who are exempt from who do not serve, we speak about 25% approximately who are Arabs and they are not even called up for service. And then a lot of the other people uh, are either ultra Orthodox men who do not serve in the army. They defer the service and afterwards they become exempt for service after several years um, because they learn in yeshivot. And uh, so a lot of it is, is ultra-Orthodox men. And 
I think about 17% of the men, uh, of the males are, are exempt. And it's going to rise in the next 10 years, it's gonna come up until it, almost 25%. And um, women uh, can declare that for religious reasons, they mm. uh, do not, and, and about a third of the women declare that for the religious reasons, they uh, do not enlist. So this is the current model. This is the problem we are speaking about. Half of the people serve for a very long time, 32 months uh, uh, for males, 24 months for, uh, for, for women, uh, for a very long time, only half. This is the question we are speaking about, whether it's sustainable, this model. So, so maybe the balance is between, how do we balance between the fact that uh, we are, we're still not at a point where we are able to abandon the mandatory service on the one hand, but on the other hand, we all admit that the army doesn't really need all the people. Um, so Johan, actually, I wanted to ask you, does the army need all the 18-year-old men and women? And the, and the reason I wanted to ask, uh, to ask you the question is because sometimes we hear the ultra-orthodox uh, politicians say, well, the army doesn't need all these people. Uh, why do you insist on drafting all the orthodox, uh, ultra-orthodox people, which is so hard both to them and to the military to have them within? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a great question because on the one hand, the reason why uh, there's an insistence because the principle of equality, you cannot demand one part of the population less than half to serve for almost three years uh, with low pay, less than a minimum, a lot less than a minimum wage, risk their lives and give up their freedom, and others can, uh, uh, you know, continue with their lives as usual. So this is the uh, the normative uh, legal side, uh, and the, and then there's the other aspect, which is, uh, as you mentioned, this, the aspect of the constraints and actual needs of the IDF system. Now, uh, uh, currently, uh, so far, somehow it worked out that the serving, the, the serving populations, i.e. not the ultra-Orthodox and, uh, and the Arab population, uh, served in very high numbers. They continue to serve in very high numbers. And those populations, uh, had pretty much a role within the military and the IDF. As Amichai mentioned, we're expecting a demographic growth uh, within the upcoming decade, and that will challenge the IDF with, because all of a sudden, uh, the cohort of those who do serve will grow tremendously, and, and, and can they actually find sufficient positions? Now, there are other trends, which we've discussed in other uh, um, um, and workshops and so on that we're, that we're running, other trends. Um, uh, the army is becoming more technological, more professional. So, so it needs high quality combatants, technicians, uh, intel uh, uh, professionals. So it needs a whole uh, uh, array of professionals and they need them for a longer period because the military profession becomes more complicated. And then others are less required, even from the existing cohort. So the pressure on, on the service model is not, on, does not only uh, arise uh, uh, from the demographic change, i.e. mainly growth of the ultra-Orthodox population. It's one kind of pressure, but the change of the military profession is another kind of pressure. Uh, the need for uh, 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 less soldiers on the one hand and more professional soldiers on the other hand. And there's pressure, you alluded to it, which we, uh, we published the figures and, and we were surprised ourselves. And you know, I'd be glad to hear what you think about it. But the fact that, uh, so, that so many Israelis support uh, a transition to an AVF, to an all volunteer force, to a, what we call in Hebrew, a professional army model to basically do away with mandatory service. Now, we know within the sort of, professional circles, and yeah, and there's no serious pundit or uh, observer or uh, a, a politician that actually advocates for this transition. So it's totally bottom up. More than half of Israelis and a large majority of the youngsters between 18 and 30 year olds are, are saying, well, the current situation doesn't make sense, is unsustainable, let's transition to an AVF model. Now we know 
that, or at least, you know, I'll share my opinion. And, and, and I think we, we agree on that. An AVF model does not provide Israel, uh, it does not address or does not provide uh, an answer to Israel's security needs. Because the main, if I have to put my finger on the one factor that the AVF model, if, if we, uh, it, 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 we, we still need a very large army, so we need uh, dozens of thousands of, Israel, of Israelis every year. It, uh, uh, it will be a lot more costly, but the most important factor, we still need the highest quality of young Israelis to come with the highest level of motivation. And this, uh, if it's not obligatory or the, or the fiction of, of a mandatory service will not be there, we won't get those highest quality Israelis to serve in, 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 in the high tech units and the technical uh, combat and so on. So we need- well, We don't know sustain. that for sure, but we don't want to take a chance. Exactly. So we need to sustain this unsustainable model. Yeah, Amichai, you wanted to follow on, on that? You, you uh, pointed your finger. I, I, I... Yeah, no, no. I just wanted to raise, a, and Johan later alluded to it, to the question, to the young people who are uh, supporting this move. And, and it, uh, on the basis of it is not only a question of the numbers, it's a question of the general public trust. In the military, we have done a, a service of public trust in the military, and we see uh, still public trust in the IDF in Israel is, is very high, but it's in decline. And in specific areas, it's even getting really low if, if you ask, if you break it up. And it's, I think um, uh, what you said, Yohanan, is exactly correct in the sense that the question of equality, this is the main question, the, I, the, the uh, perception that there is deep inequality in this situation where young people who come from specific sectors do not serve and young people who come from specific sectors serve for a long time, this inequality and, and of course risks their lives. It's not only the question of service, it's a question of, of risking their lives is, is a question. And I know uh, Edith, perhaps you wanna speak a little about the question of equality or inequality, which is at the core of, of this of this issue yeah yeah we'll soon talk about the the place the principle of equality is playing uh in the whole discussion as i, th I think we all agree that it has a major uh a major role in the discussion both uh for why why it, 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 it all we're talking and what are the implications of adopting a new model on equality on different manners gender equality and quality in general uh, but bef but even before that, uh, even before talking about a new model of service, we know that the Knesset now is required to enact a new law for the recruitment of uh, the ultra orthodox. And Jochen, I don't think there's anyone more suitable than you to describe it just really shortly. I know you've been in this business for um, many many years, so as shortly as you can, just describe us. Um, there is now a law under consideration that will alter the current arrangement. So. What contributions would this make to the Israeli society? But also, uh, where does it fall short? Well, why is the law required? It's required because the, the government and the state needs a legal arrangement that it will allow it to provide massive exemptions to the ultra-Orthodox men. Ultra-Orthodox women get an exemption because they are religious and all religious women or all uh, 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 women in Israel that declare that they're religious because there are some secular women that declare that they're religious and uh, get an automatic uh, exemption. But ultra-Orthodox men need the special legislation. This is what the Supreme Court required because of the issue of, of, uh, of uh, equality and the, or the aspiration for equality. Now, the previous legal arrangement that enabled the uh, massive numbers of the ultra-Orthodox community to avoid service, this previous arrangement was struck down by the Supreme Court, not for the first time, uh, was struck down in, in late 2017. And the Supreme Court gave the Knesset a year to come up with an alternative legislation. That happened in late 2017. We're deep into 2022. And the Knesset didn't yet come up with an alternative legal arrangement. Part of it this is partially what accompanied the, the, 
the, the political deadlock that we experienced in Israel. So for the past almost five years, the Israeli, or less, because it struck down in 2017, but it became a void in late 18. But generally, we can say that for the past almost five years, the, the, basically the IDF is providing exemptions without a proper legal arrangement that enables it. So this, there's just a requirement because we know the IDF is, uh, does not wish to coerce ultra-Orthodox, dozens of thousands of ultra-Orthodox men to serve against their will. And therefore there needs to be a legal arrangement. So it was, uh, and, and the, the, the short version, and, uh, and, and we, you know, since we want the conversation to move on, the short version of the change in this new, in this- uh, in, You didn't want to say anything. In the new legislation that is now, that passed the first reading in the Knesset and is uh, supposed to pass a second and third reading, again, assuming the political crisis will, uh, uh, not over uh, override this issue as well. The short version of the uh, of this current legislation is: all ultra orthodox uh, men uh, cannot serve until the age of twenty one. If they do, they can. If they don't, they don't have to. They have to go to yeshiva and and demonstrate, provide proof that they are going to a higher yeshiva or or a kollel. And at age twenty one they gain an exemption. And, uh, and, uh, and, and the military has some goals of all, uh, relatively very modest goals of about 10% of the ultra-Orthodox cohort that are supposed to serve uh, uh, either in military or civil service. So basically it's a legal arrangement that means that ultra-Orthodox men, if they do not want, they don't have to serve. And, uh, and at age 21, the new thing about it, and, and, and given the awkward, unstable, unsustainable situation that we're at, we at IDI advocated and pushed for the idea of providing an exemption at age 21, because under the realization that anyway, massive amounts of ultra-Orthodox are not going to serve, we at least don't want to create that as a barrier for them from entering the workforce at a young enough age when they can still uh, 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 join uh, the workforce productively. And, uh, and, and this is the big change that is supposed to take place. The fact that ultra-Orthodox men will not only gain an exemption from service, but also an exemption from the yeshiva and choose their own life. So uh, Amichai, soon I'll ask you about the court and uh, at the place it plays. Uh, in the whole, but allow me not to make it easy on both of you. And I would like to hear uh, both your opinion. Of, is this new arrangement does uh, promote equality or it reflects a political understanding of what can be done and what is not possible uh, giving the political uh, constraints? Amichai, we'll start with you. So, so first of all, it reflects political reality. You're completely correct, but this political arrangement has to pass the uh, critical eye of the Israeli Supreme Court who struck down three arrangements previously. So it's not enough to come to a political arrangement. You have to convince. Now, what, what's the um, basic arranging idea be behind it? And it's not only regarding ultra-Orthodox. You have to take a wider look. So. First of all, needless to say, uh, the right and the principle of equality are core principles. And the, the aspiration, Yohanan spoke about the aspiration for equality, or you spoke, I think, about the aspiration for equality, it has to be maintained. And, and I wanna, uh, I stand corrected, but I, I wanna comment on what Yohanan said, that the numbers are merely 10% of the ultra-Orthodox men have to, at least it's a growing number. Within a generation, the, uh, the idea is that more and more ultra-Orthodox. Yeah, but should. growing, but the demographic growth is uh, but, probably okay, larger. But, but and, no, but even I'm quite skeptical about this percentage. Even, even, okay, even in percentage term, but even more importantly, what Yohanan is saying, I think, is you have to take a wider look on the principle of equality and from at least two angles. First of all, you don't look only on the army service. You look at the contribution to society. 
The problem with the ultra-Orthodox society, we are focusing on the ultra-Orthodox society here, but the problem with the ultra-Orthodox society is much wider than military service. The problem with the ultra-Orthodox society is that a growing number, and it's immense number, maybe people who are watching us uh, don't know the, the, the demographics of, of this segment of Israeli society. Within a generation, a third of the workforce will be of the potential workforce will be ultra orthodox. So, if they don't uh, uh, join the workforce, Israel will not be able to gather enough taxes in order to provide services for its uh, 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 citizens. So, take a wider look at contribution to society, and the goal is at least get out to the uh, uh, um, market, at least work, at least pay taxes, at least contribute to the country in this, these terms. And the second point, which is extremely important, is that the entire discussion up until now has been focused on how do we enlist people to serve. But equality is a balance between two wings, right? There is one side of equality of the people who do not serve and whether we can politically solve this problem. And I agree, once again, it's a question. And there are those who serve and how do we make uh, the life easier for those who serve? Now, there are some things we cannot do. Now, people who serve risk their lives. This is a binary choice, right? You either serve and risk your life or you don't serve and don't risk your life. But there are other, uh, also, um, uh, other things included in service. So the length of service. So do we really need a 32 month uh, uh, mandatory service? Can we live with a shorter service? I, uh, my claim is that we can live with a significantly shorter service. I don't want to put numbers here. We're, we're, we have in our papers, we have certain numbers. Other people have other numbers. But it's you know significantly less the uh, um, the uh, compensation for soldiers who do serve, right? Especially for those who lengthen. So the IDF will need to uh, ask or um, suggest offer those people who enlist for many of them to lengthen the service if we shorten uh, significantly. The mandatory service, the IDF will have to offer a lot of people to lengthen the service. They should be compensated properly. Um, the um, what people get when who serve, what is the economic or in terms of uh, other terms, what are the advantages they get when they are um, when they finish the, the the service and are discharged. From mandatory service, so you you have to think not only on one wing on, on another. And indeed, you you uh, uh, worked on on the question of uh, exemptions and equality within service. So also there is also this angle of equality, not only between those who serve and don't serve, and also but also on exemptions and and other issues of of equality. Right, so, so Johan, you wanted to, to add something about for, for this, this manner? Well, I, I, I want to, you know, I want to take your role of uh, yeah. the impact, uh, well, not your yeah, role. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, so, let, so let me give some, uh, some, back, some, back, some, back, some background and I'll get back to you with the question I have in mind, uh, knowing that you are uh, personally involved in that. Uh, uh, yeah, well, you know, per, my it's, daughter it's, is, it's, is now in a combat unit, and I'm right. very proud of it, by the way. We all and, and I think, and I think that the something worth mentioning is the role, uh, the fabulous role that women play in the IDF, not as a, uh, not because the IDF is a, is a feminist organization, but because they're providing. Uh, a, a, a fabulous contribution uh, to combat units increasingly, uh, right. but obviously to the Air Force and intelligence and uh, all professional. Uh, right. so, so let me give some numbers. Um, okay. 
Okay, so so as you said, um, almost ninety percent of the units are now open to women, um, and this number is uh, is keep on growing, <laughs> but. But, but yet some units remained closed, which brings several uh, petitions to be submitted um, uh, to the Supreme Court. Uh, actually, these days we're waiting for the decision and the, and the answer of, uh, of the IDF. And also the chief of staff appointed uh, a team headed by a general to discuss this topic and to come back with that to us with, um, with a new announcement of uh, what other units might be open to, to women's service. But, Knowing uh, the limitations of women's service alongside, uh, well, and we have to admit it's not only ultra orthodox, it's also modern orthodox, and there are restrictions and limitations. Can you imagine uh, how does it get along, get along with an army where um, huge or even just big amount of uh, number of ultra orthodox serve? Is it really possible um, to have may maybe by uh, enforcing equality? From, the, uh, from one side, we're giving up some other aspects of equality. Of equality, exactly. So I must say that this um, issue, when, when I dealt with it 10 years ago in the Knesset, very intensively with this issue, I wasn't as aware as I am right now to the impact of a dramatic increase of service of ultra-Orthodox men in the IDF on what it will do for the, how it will impact and affect the equality of women within uh, that do serve in the IDF. Now, it's also a normative moral issue, but it's also a practical issue. If you want a significant amount of those, uh, of the ultra-Orthodox cohort of men to serve with, with in their own terms, i.e. women-free zones, it basically would change fundamentally the, the, um, <clears throat> the landscape of what the IDF, the institution of the IDF. It will basically mean that today the secular women, which are the women who serve, the vast majority, there are some religious women who serve, but they are a tiny minority. The vast majority are secular women uh, who, who, who provide fabulous, fantastic and, 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 and extremely important service uh, in, in an array of areas, they're basically going to desert a, a, an, an institution uh, that will marginalize, alienate, uh, uh, treat them as second class. So it's both legally and morally uh, wrong, but it will be also practically a very stupid thing to do. So this is why uh, the, 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 the policy uh, 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 that, uh, that should be adopted by the IDF is maximum number of ultra-Orthodox men who, who, who uh, to sort of enlist, to try and enlist a maximum number of ultra-Orthodox men for uh, in, a, in, a, in a service age, i.e. between 18 and 21, uh, to um, real service positions, not only all sorts of fictitious, in the IDF's mamlachti terms i.e. not changing the face of the idea. If you, and, and in order to do that, part of the incentive would be to dramatically increase the uh, compensation, including, including monetary compensation. And that might play a role with some ultra-Orthodox, those who are wishing to serve and, uh, and are interested in the compensation and in serving their, their nation in this way, but they will do it in the terms of the Jewish and democratic state. And otherwise, they'll get, gain an exemption at age 21 and join the workforce. So this is another element of equality that I was less aware of in the past. All of these pressures from so many directions mean that we're now in a, we need to hold on to the mandatory service model, but it's a very unstable model. So we're proposing all sorts of um, um, uh, polls and, and, and uh, artificial support mechanisms, i.e. more compensation uh, and, uh, and so on, to try and preserve something that there's no real alternative for, but it just demonstrates how, how, uh, how great this challenge is. We know that politicians are dealing with it, defense ministry officials, IDF, uh, 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 finance ministry. It's a, it's, a, it's a big issue and obviously we're dealing with it. And, uh, and it's a lot more complex 
than the slogans that are used by some politicians to try and depict it. So another instability um, we, sh- we witness is uh, re- re- regards the career service, and we used to say, we always say that it's hard to hard or even impossible to separate the discussion of the model of service from the discussion of the career service. And we had some uh, discussions at the IDI regarding the career service. So I want to ask you, Amichai, what do you think about the relationship between, between these two topics? Are they related? Can we discuss the model of service without answering the challenges of the career service? Does one depend uh, on the other or, or not? So traditionally, a career service was considered uh, a smaller part, uh, both in terms of numbers and in terms of importance, of the military, so the main service is the mandatory service. And then you need some people to stay for more officers, high level officers, specific professionals. So the main body of the army who are the people who uh, uh, um, uh, serve on on the mandatory service. And then you need to enlist some people to uh, career service. Uh, the, this is certainly changing. It's changing for many reasons. One of them is what we just discussed. And it's that uh, if you shorten significantly the um, length of mandatory service, then needless to say, there is a requirement for more people serving in career service. And this will rectify some deficiencies of the IDF which are traditionally, for example, the IDF does not have a good backbone of NCOs. So what what holds uh, armies in the West are the uh, long service of the NCOs. The IDF does not really have this kind of combat NCOs who serve for a long time. And um, there are problems in terms of getting uh, officers to sign to sign on for career service, not a lot of people are signing on for officers course in a very short time, and then they are they, they want out. They don't want to stay. So how do you convince people to stay for the career in the army? Do we need an Israeli West Point, right? So 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 these questions and ideas we we are uh, required to deal with them at this point. Although traditionally. It was not a matter of discussion in in, uh, in Israel. So, um, summing up, I want to bring us back to reality. And uh, Jochen, I want to ask you, talking about reality. So, we all spoke about possible reforms and solutions, but there's a lot, as you as you've said, there's a lot of political instability uh, right now. So. Honestly speaking, uh, what, if any, change is really possible in the current political reality? Well, the, you know, the reduction of the exemption age, which we sort of sounds almost like a technical issue, but the implication of it is quite dramatic, with basically releasing to the workforce or for their own choice, dozens of thousands of ultra-Orthodox men every year, passed in the government, passed the first reading in the Knesset, and, uh, and, and, and assuming this government will survive more than a few weeks, I think, it might pass in the Knesset as well because because again, there's no legal arrangement currently in place to allow the military uh, to provide those massive numbers of exemptions. So there's a real need at least to regulate this uh, portion of of, uh, providing massive numbers of exemptions every year. And therefore there's an opportunity to make this small change of uh, providing the exemption also at age 21. The broader issue of the, the changes, uh, shortening the, uh, the service uh, model and so on, some of those broader issues, the, the barrier is not the political barrier yet. There's still the professional barrier of the IDF figuring out how it wants to go about it, finance ministry, um, and people like us who are taking part in this discussion, I mean, I think we're getting there in terms of creating uh, an improved model and there is a growing understanding. There are also some differences, mainly around the role that uh, civil service uh, uh, can can play to sort of uh, um, 
solve some of the problems of equality and so on. So there are some, I think, some illusions about the role that uh, a massive amount of Israelis that will serve in civil service. So there are some issues that, that need to be resolved in the broader sense. I think it's not an issue, and, and, and I wouldn't blame politics for that. I mean, politics is not doing anything good to resolve it, but it's also not the barrier. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that we're right now, the, the, the IDF increasingly, one of its major challenges will be to continue to tweak and, and, and fine tune and deal with this huge problem of, of, the, of the challenge of the service model, uh, because it will really determine whether the IDF will continue to have access to the highest quality, most highly motivated Israelis that are, are currently uh, 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 creating this magic of providing Israel with security. And Michal, do you want to take a guess of the Supreme Court will approve the new arrangement or? Um, there are also changes in the, um, uh, in the way the Supreme Court, the Israeli Supreme Court is, consist, is consistent now. So there are personal changes in the Israeli Supreme Court. And I think, I don't know if they'll accept, I have, I have no idea, but I think they will take a fresh look at it. It won't be like the last time where they said, we're not even looking at it, you, you've done nothing. So I think they'll take a serious uh, look into the new arrangement with the context we have spoken about. Is it, my, I'm looking at the time, and for me it says that it's time to bring Tamar back to us. So Tamar, are you with us? And thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Thank you all so much for for this interesting conversation. I feel like we could go on for a few more hours. Um, but yeah, we have around 10 more minutes to get some questions from the audience and some have come in on the chat and some have come in privately. So I would like to, to try to go through a few of those and, and continue our conversation. So one question that came up about the short, the idea about shorter service and the idea, the question was, won't shorter service have implications on training, i.e. looking at the ratio of training time to post-training time, how would that affect the quality of the IDF? And that can go to whoever wants to, to start with that. Well, Amichai, I'll say something about that because I do, I, I did promise initially that you would say something about the journalist in the event right. in the morning. So uh, yes, so we I'll, had another question. I'll, I'll leave your air time for that. So Thank you. look, the, the, Question of, 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 of training is, is, there's no one generic answer. There are so many roles. And in, for some positions, there's a, you know, like a pilot or some of the special forces units, the, it requires three years of training until you can become operational. And for those units, assuming uh, standard service will go down to about two years, for those uh, units in order to serve there, the third year will already have to be uh, with regular pay. And beyond that, those who serve there will have to commit to an additional three years uh, or so on, which is what happens today with pilots, with some of the special uh, forces units. Uh, when we get to the sort of more regular infantry, for example, the, uh, the model stipulates that if it's, it's gonna be around two years of service, uh, the military in order to ensure that it has a, a sufficient number of, of, of those who serve will be able to coerce uh, those who serve there for an additional half year with pay. And, and then, on the, but that will enable to release after two years, those who have a shorter training period and there's no need to leave them for a longer period. So I, I don't know exactly the number, there are various assessments depending on who makes the uh, calculation, but in this model of two years plus half year, plus uh, a longer periods for professionals or officers, uh, perhaps 20, 20%, 40% would have to stay on for an additional half year, and the rest can make do with uh, approximately uh, uh, two years. But the, you know, those are the kinds of, of challenges, but then when we reduce the, the burden of service for the vast majority only to two years, it somehow decreases the, gap, the in, inequality yeah. gap uh, between those who serve and those who do not serve. So you, you reduce it by a shorter service, greater compensation, and, uh, and hopefully a, 
uh, allowing the others to contribute to Israeli society in another way. Thank you. Any other comments on that before we go to Amichai to comment on the recent news and recent events with the journalist? Okay, so let's go to Amichai. Um, so, um, so the, uh, I, I assume everyone present knows that uh, uh, the, of the uh, unfortunate death of Shirin Abu Akleh, um, uh, a journalist who died this morning, and it was, and this is uncontested, during an IDF clash with the uh, Palestinians. So there are many questions there, and actually, <laughs> When we spoke a second uh, before, you, you know, going on air, we said, well, maybe we should have discussed, had we known, we should have discussed uh, uh, this issue. There are issues of, uh, uh, you know, we have experience in it. I'll just raise the a decade ago, uh, more than a decade now, the uh, Mavi Marmara uh, uh, incident, um, and, and other instances, of course, the, the, the Goldstone report, et cetera. So these questions come up periodically. And the, um, the, the issue right now, as I see it, is the main issue is the question of investigation. So we don't really know the facts yet. Before we come to conclusions about morality of soldiers, about um, um, you know, opening fire, about the role of journalists, et cetera, we we, did, we don't know the facts uh, yet. So the main question, the main discussion, currently I think, at least legally, I don't know, in terms of the media, is who will investigate and can you trust um, the IDF to internally investigate the, uh, the issue? The point is that the IDF, and, and in this, it is not long. Western armies in the past, I would say two decades, have gone tremendous changes, uh, um, tremendous changes in their internal investigations. So it's actually, when we speak about internal investigations, it's not even a correct term. A lot of these investigations have some kind of uh, outside oversight, civilian oversight, the oversight of the attorney general regard, the, the civilian attorney general regarding investigation in Israel, for example, has been strengthened significantly the way it's, it's uh, investigated. Of course, you know, politically, it might be as was the, the, the fact in the Marmara case that the, there will be some investigation with external, when I speak about external, international, observers, so some kind of international observers, but basically we have in place in the IDF, as in other uh, armed forces, um, sufficient uh, um, internal, and what, when I said internal, as I said, it's not even exactly internal, it's military uh, investigated capabilities. Michael, with your permission, I'd like to sort of make two quick comments. Number one, the Palestinian pathologist who uh, um, made the surgery on, uh, on, the, on the body of the deceased uh, journalist said that he cannot determine who shot. And, you know, the IDF spokesperson said, well, the IDF still can't determine because the uh, proper investigation wasn't made. They, uh, they think it's actually Palestinians, but they can't determine. So there's serious question marks about the, the data itself, but then there's a different clock, not the, because you're mentioning who's the, you know, the uh, serious investigations take time, but there's a different clock that already erupted this morning and it takes on in the, in the social networks and it doesn't wait for the, act, for the real outcome of an investigation and they're depending, and, and they're, you know, on the Palestinian side and, and and I, in other parts, it's already the IDF, uh, quote unquote, murdered uh, a reporter and nobody's waiting for the, uh, 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 for the facts and the truth. And, 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 and this is challenging because this has real life implications, even if it's not based on facts. No, no, no you're correct. And as I said, the way the IDF can counter this pressure 
you're the expert on, on political issues, but historically, one solution in cases like this was for the IDF to invite external oversight, not to turn it to an international investigation, but to invite external, the, the, in the Marmar case, this is what happened to international uh, observers where- uh, yeah, You're uh, right, although in this people. case, the only, the caveat would be that you would need collaboration of the Palestinians that actually took the body and have much of the evidence and so on. And you can, uh, uh, listen, um, we're, we're not, you know, opening up the investigation between <laughs> us right now. We don't have the, the data, but a, a lot can be done uh, uh, in terms of, of investigating the soldiers, looking at photos, looking at, there is a lot of uh, uh, documentation right. involving this even without the body. So a lot of it can be done, perhaps not everything, but a lot of it can be done. A serious investigation can and should be conduct, conducted. Perhaps the way to counter political pressure and international pressure is to bring in some, some kind of, of external observance. Yeah, thank you. I know it's a complicated issue and I appreciate I appreciate you trying to tackle it in the last few minutes as we asked it, just to bring up other thoughts and ideas about it. And with that being said, we only have um, a few more minutes, only two more minutes, so I don't, or even one now. So I don't want to bring up a whole new big question because I want, I don't think it will give it justice, and that's why I'm, I'm happy to say that we're going to continue to partner with IDI on on more webinars to come up. We have one coming up in September and December, so please look out for for information about that. So it's always to be continued, which I really appreciate that um, that partnership with IDI. But with that being said, in this last minute that we have, I do want to give um, all three of you a moment or two for a closing sentence or two that you would like to, to leave us with today. Um, and why don't we start with Amichai, why don't we start with you, then Edith, and then we'll go to Yohanan. Uh, I, I wanted to comment on, on uh, when Yohanan said his daughter is in the army, I want to jump up and say, listen, I have two sons right now serving in the army and continuing uh, Yohanan's uh, uh, point, both of them have signed up for uh, more years in the army than they needed for reasons, for, for different reasons uh, each. For us in Israel, it's a deeply personal question. Mm -hmm. the, the existence of the army, it's not, uh, as I said, it's important for, the, for, for protecting Israel, for the security of Israel, but it's also very, very, very personal. And this is why for us, for me, and I think for all other participants here, uh, uh, this is extremely important. Uh, solving this issue, looking at it is extremely important. Thank you. So I have a son that is already training to the army, but is not yet in the army. But I also always say that there is no such a thing that uh, is the business of the military in Israel, and it's not this business of the society or any person in Israel and vice versa, challenges of the society takes place in the military at the end of the day. And the model of service is a great example of how this took our connect. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And you, Helen? Uh, well, um, you know, we, I mentioned my daughter. I, I can also mention myself because we talked about the challenges and there are huge challenges for an issue that is extremely important and unfortunately, this is the only IDF issue that the IDF cannot resolve on its own. For this, the IDF needs us, the broader society, the, the a, a, a civil society to help and shape and, and this important institution that while is extremely important, obviously for the survival of the state, is also an institution that does wonders and, 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 and uh, as a, it's not the primary goal, but as an educational institution, empowering uh, so many young Israelis to do uh, wonderful things. And, and, uh, and, and this perhaps is one of the reasons that leads me to continue to serve in, in reserves in my very, very late age. And, uh, and, I, and I'm quite proud of it. And I think we, uh, we, we really, there's something there that is important to help uh, uh, preserve for all of those good reasons. 
Thank you. Thank all of you for for just even those last statements of really framing it in a way and letting us leave thinking about all the other comments that we discussed in understanding how personal, how important of figuring, figuring this out and supporting the IDF in, in any way we can. So thank you, Yochanan, Edith, and Amichai, and thank you to all the, the team at IDI that's behind the scenes that helped put this all together. I really appreciate you. I see that you're in attendance and I see you and thank you. And we look forward to continuing this, um, this partnership and continuing putting together programs that help inform everybody of what's what's going on. So thank you all and, and have a wonderful day.